Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to this evening's Zoom presentation in conversation with a very spe special guest this evening. Uh, I've just got a few points of housekeeping before we start properly, but um, good evening and welcome to the Royal Photographic Society's In Conversation Talks with some of our recent bursary recipients. Uh, with plenty more of our Thursday evening distinctions talks lined up through into July, and we have one more bursary talk on the 14th of July. So please check out the RPS website to see the details and to sign up. Admission is free, of course. Before I introduce you to this evening's guest, I wanted to remind you that we do have two offers to attendees to our online events. If you're not already a member of the RPS, by attending any of our online events, you can get 20% off RPS membership. Uh, you can see details here on the slide of the URL that you need um, and I'll show the slide again at the end of the this evening's presentation. If you are already the mem a member then welcome and we appreciate you joining us this evening and we appreciate you being members of the RPS and thank you for your continued support during these difficult times. And we also have a very special scheme for members by referring a friend to join the RPS, both you and your friend can get 20% off membership. So again, the, the URL you need is at the bottom of the screen and uh, I will again show the slide at the end of the evening. So these offers are both open to anyone attending any online event during July and June. The other reason I know many of you are attending this evening uh, is because you may be thinking of making your own application to one of the society's bursaries. The Joan Wakeling Social Documentary Bursary closed it earlier this week, but the Environmental Bursary and the Postgrad Bursary both remain open until the 3rd of July, so you, you still have time to, to get your application in. Details of all of those bursaries are on the slides that you can see at the moment. And again, I'll show this slide at the end of the evening. So welcome again. Uh, we've got over or oh, nearly 200 people or so um, joining this evening, gradually bumping up the numbers. Um, the format for this evening will be much like the previous events that we've held here. It's a very gentle conversation with our guest speaker. Uh, for around 40 minutes or so, followed by a question of answer, an answer for up to about a, a half an hour, depending on, on how many of you have questions. Uh, we'll also see and most importantly hear about the images that have formed part of our guest bursary project um, a couple of years ago. So uh, I've referred to a guest and I'm going to introduce him now. <coughs> So our guest this evening is Nicholas White, who you can hopefully see next to me on the screen. Nicholas is a photographer living in the centre of Dartmoor National Park in southwest England. Uh, he was the re recipient of the Photographic Angle Royal Photographic Society Environmental Bursary in 2017. His project Black Dots explored mountain bothies and bothy culture throughout the United Kingdom and I'm sure many of you have seen the pictures from that series um, in various publications and also in the, the RPS's International Photography Exhibition, which is where I first became aware of Nicholas's work. Um, that work, Black Dots, also became Nicholas's first monograph, and that was published by Another Place Press in 2018. Nicholas's personal work examines the landscape and the ways that we interact with our natural spaces. He works on long-term projects in addition to undertaking commercial and editorial assignments internationally. So in 2017, Nicholas was named as a winner in the Lens Culture Emerging Talent Awards. He was awarded the RPS Photographic Angle Environmental Bursary, which helped him begin working on his current working progress, Carpathia. And obviously we'll be looking at images and discussing that a little bit later. Um, and Carpathia was looking at documenting the formation of a new European wilderness reserve in the Carpathian Mountains of Romania. Nicholas's work has also been included in the Magenta Foundation Flash Forward. You may have seen it in the British Journal of Photography's Portrait of Britain. 
project and he's, he was also named as the judge's choice in landscape photographer of the year. So that very long introduction, Nicholas, <laughs> was, I mean, I think you've achieved so much in, I think, what's a relatively short space of time. So I hope I haven't embarrassed you too much by that. But um, perhaps we can start this evening's conversation. And perhaps you'd like to tell everyone here, and I'll switch to some slides in a moment, but how did you, what got you started with photography? Um, well, thanks for the intro. And thank you for everyone spending their time listening to me and, me and Michael natter on for 40 minutes. Um, I think, yeah, I'm going to start off by, I'm going to go way, way, way back. Um, I'm not going to run through my entire life, but <clears throat> I'm going to start with this photo um, of me and my family up on, up on Dartmoor, which, I get, yeah, kind of, kind of explains a little bit about why I started photographing and why I do the things that I do. Um, I was quite lucky, I guess, to have a family that, you know, encouraged a a life outside um you know i talk about it quite a lot but we never had a never had a telly as a as kids we didn't spend any time indoors really it was all out climbing making dens you know we both joined the cub scouts when we were old enough um and our sort of the highlight of the year was these kind of these annual holidays to my grandparents place on dartmoor and we'd go out letterboxing and climbing the tours um and my gran always had this 35 mil with her all the time and we've got heaps and heaps of these photographs of, of my family and, you know, climbing up and letterboxing on Dartmoor. Um, and it, you know, as I got older, I sort of wanted to be the one with the camera. Um, yeah, so this is me and my brother um, on Hound Tour, which is actually now not too far from where I live. Um, I know my brother's actually watching today as well, so I do apologise for including this. <laughs> Uh, I think yeah. your mum's here as well, isn't she? So, um, hello um, to yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what was your first camera? What, was, what were the first pictures that you were taking? So my first, when I was old enough to sort of do, go on sort of walking trips on my own or with friends, um, my friend had a digital compact, which is like, you know, unheard of. You know, he was the one with the digital camera. Um, and so we'd go out on these little day trips up on the local common um and i would borrow his camera and i'd just take photos of the landscape pretty much like it was it was all centered around documenting my little adventures pretty much that's all it really was um and and it kind of became more and more crucial to that experience of being outdoors like whereas before i'd go for a walk with a mate and i'd take a camera as i got older i wanted to go out with a camera and that was the sole purpose for going, you know. Um, and then when I started sort of um, taking photography more seriously, I was, I was really, really um, into the work of guys like Joe Cornish and Charlie Waite. I, I, I sort of loved the, the dramatic vista, you know, the beautiful, beautiful landscape. Um, and, and that really sort of opened my eyes to, you know, shifting that, mindset from just walking through a landscape to actually thinking about all the elements the light you know and sort of trying to figure out compositions that i'd seen in his book you know stuff like that and was it people like joe cornish perhaps ansel adams that were inspirations for you at that time or were you still sort of finding your feet as a oh, photographer so um you know i you know years and years and years ago i, I remember buying a digital camera magazine and you know going up to Tesco's every month or whatever and buying the magazine. Um, and yeah, they were, they were huge, you know, because for me, my experience of the outdoors was my local national park. And then when I saw stuff like Anson Adams, I was like, oh my God, like, this is incredible. Um, and so, yeah, definitely in the early times, like starting out, I would try and simulate shots that I'd seen on the front cover of Digital Camera Magazine or stuff that I'd seen in the Joe Cornish book. Mm -hmm. That, that changed slightly as I moved into uh, arts college and university. Um, I started sort of exploring different ways of photographing the landscape, you know, but and like building projects and narratives and things like that. But even to this day, I, I still love the work of, of those sort of landscape photographers that got me into photography to begin with. 
Yeah, they are very special, aren't they? And did, did you study photography formally then? Did you go through the sort of usual BA photography type, type path or, or did you study something else that overlapped with photography? No, so originally my plan was to be a, um, a thrash metal drummer. <laughs> was my, that was my goal. Um, I had the ponytail, I had the lip piercing, I was, I was set. Um, and then, so I studied all through college, I was, that was my thing. I studied sound engineering and, and, and music at A-level. Um, and then kind of did a U-turn and, and yeah, went back a couple of years and did a BTEC national diploma in photography, which really explores, you know, the technical aspects of, you know, working in the dark room and what aperture is and what shutter speed is and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then I was hooked and then I progressed onto a degree and did a, a BA in photography. And that was a Plymouth College. What do you think, what do you think that um, sort of formal education gave you? Did you find it useful? Because a lot of photographers maybe haven't gone through formal education and they've gone on to create careers, others have done. I just wonder what you got from that education that you, you did. Yeah, I think everyone's obviously, everyone's different. But for me personally, um, it was, it was great to be able to do nothing but photography for five years. So that, that was what it was for me. That It wasn't, you know, my motivations were, this course is great because I basically get to do my hobby for five years and nothing else. Um, and also network with like-minded individuals. So every single day I would spend in a room full of people that also wanted to take pictures. And that was, that was a huge thing for me. Mm. I wouldn't necessarily say that if you want to be a photographer, you have to go down that route, of course. But for me, it was it was definitely invaluable. Right. Well, I want to, to bring you on now to one of your early projects. I mean, clearly you've got an affinity and, and love for landscape and, and I think wilderness as well. Um, you're living in Dartmoor, which is a wonderful place to be, even when the weather's maybe not quite so great, although right. that makes it special anyway. Um, one of your sort of early projects looked at the, the militarization of the national park and I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and, and what got you started on that first project. Sure, I think I said earlier, that, you know, when I started with photography, I was looking very much into the single image and then when I went through university, I started thinking more about projects and, and sort of weaving narratives and things like that. And a, a huge inspiration for me at uni was Simon Norfolk. Um, and I fell in love with the way that he, he was a landscape photographer first and foremost, but he photographed battlefields and battle space and made it look beautiful. So it was a, for me, it was a completely fresh take on, you know, conflict uh, photography. You know, we, we, we look at conflict photography like Don McCullen, for example. Um, but, Simon's was this really kind of turning point when I discovered his work, which was, oh, so you can shoot landscape, but you can talk about these huge issues at the same time. And that was a new thing for me. Um, obviously, as, as a student, I couldn't just fly out to Afghanistan and shoot, <laughs> and shoot landscapes. And so I turned my, my eyes back to Dartmoor again. It was there for me again. Um, and, and the National Park has been a militarised zone for, for, for many, many, many years. Um, but I found it interesting how it's beautiful and special enough to be designated a national park, but simultaneously has this sort of alter ego of being a place where you can train for war. Um, and additionally, so this was also the, my first sort of foray into using the large format camera. Um, again, it's the fact that Simon Norfolk used that was that was literally it. Joe Cornish used one. David Ward used one, Simon Norfolk used one, and I was like, I want to use one. Um, and but, what camera were you using? Say again, sorry? What camera were you using? Um, so back then, I was using an old rickety Gandolfi thing, solid wood and brass, that the equipment centre at the Arts College were reluctant to let me go out, <laughs> especially when they saw that I was taking it up here. Mm. Um, but it was really interesting because Obviously, as you've seen, I've photographed Dartmoor and I've walked on Dartmoor for years. Um, but then going back out there with a large format really sort of changed the way that I saw Dartmoor. And it was a whole new way of seeing. So it was quite interesting for me to see how I responded to a really familiar landscape um, and how different it was for me to interact with that landscape just by using this different camera and this different process. Um, I mean, I so think yeah, that's... I think that's evident in your other projects that we're going to come on to, but I think there is 
something very special about using large format. It's a very different way of photography. And as you've said, people like Simon Norfolk, I mean, but even going back to people like Ansel Adams, I think you know, firstly the quality of what they're achieving, but also the, the way that using a large format camera makes you look differently and interact with your subject differently. And I think clearly that comes across in this project. And I think people listening will, and looking will also see that evident in your, your later projects. You know, do, do you ever go back to um, perhaps slightly faster formats like 35 mil now or medium format, or are you very focused on that large format? Um, so a lot, so far, all of my, my project work, my personal work is all shot on a large format. Um, I do have a medium format set up as well that I'm starting to use for, um, I'm sort of trying to wrap my head around that process, uh, for some projects I'm kind of testing out ideas for, for winter. Um, but I do, I do use a completely digital setup for my, my commissioned work and all that the sports I do a lot of sports advertising work which is how I fund my other projects uh, and obviously for that it's all it's all DSLR yeah. uh, but it's it's nice when I get time to do personal work when I get that 5-4 out I know that you know I'm working on something for me um, and it, it's just a breath of fresh air when I get the chance to go out and use that camera you know yeah I mean, it is a wonderful discipline isn't it to do that but I'd like to do now is bring you on to Black Dots which is I, I think I first really came across your work seriously and um, I think you had some of that work in um, the, the, the RPS International Photography Exhibition and I think I think partly why I love that that series is it, it reminds me of being in the mountains and in upland areas but also you know the photography it just instills a real sense of place and I wondered if you could just tell everyone you know how you approached that project what what was the catalyst for you to to start that project yeah, I mean, again, it comes back to looking at Joe Cornish years and years ago and, you know, and those photographers. Um, it, I was in year two, year three of university, calling myself a landscape photographer, but I'd never been to Scotland. And it was almost, that was almost like, that's a sin, you know, like it's, <laughs> you can get there so easily and I've never been. Um, and so really it started through trying to find a cheap way as a student of going to say the Cairngorms where this photo was taken and for and having to like save money so I was looking at maybe wild camping or doing this other stuff and then I stumbled across Bothies and I'd never heard of them before um, and then I, I began researching them more and more and, and sort of fell in love with these tiny little shelters you know and they're dominated by this landscape um, but also the way that they attract strangers you know they're sort of these beacons in the middle of nowhere like in the loneliest parts of the British Isles these little unlocked huts where people hike all day just to gather as strangers for a night and then disperse again and that was that was that's a crucial part of the work is is the people and the portraits um, so I just embarked on this three-year project staying hiking out to Bothies staying in Bothies befriending the strangers that I was sharing the Bothies with um, and then making portraits of these strangers who then became friends you know the morning after I'd stayed there. We look, we're looking at Adam at the moment um, I mean it's just a beautiful light you've got on, on his face there and, and there's a real I don't know there's a sense of a real person I, um, was, was he just someone that you came across did you meet up and stay overnight in a Bothie and then? Yeah so all of the people in the project are total strangers who I who I just happened to meet there was no there was no the, the planning was I'm going to go to this bothy and stay for two nights or one night and I would always try and make something there but the portrait element was crucial it, it, it I didn't want it to be just a sort of a study of bothy in a landscape it had to be it had to explore that human element and I've never done portraiture before um, and I don't really, I never really enjoyed photographing people because I was quite shy. Um, and so this was my first attempt at photographing portraits. Uh, so yeah, but it, when you first meet them, obviously I don't walk into a bothy and instantly start taking a picture. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, they're as sort of curious about who I am as I am about who they are. So, you know, with no phone signal and nothing but conversation in front of the fire, you do 
you do become quite good friends with these people mm. and you instantly have a, a sort of a bond because you've both gone to a bothy so you must love the outdoors so you must have similar interests you talk about that and then you know usually they would see my 5-4 there were times when I would um, intentionally have the 5-4 out and start to start cleaning a lens because I knew the person was really interesting but I didn't want to be the one to ask and so I'd just polish a lens or clean my camera and then they'd say oh what, what's that you know and I go oh well thanks for asking now you're trapped and now, <laughs> now, and now you have a photo um, Clearly, clearly a method to your madness. <laughs> I, think so. I think so. I mean, this one here, the secret behind this is my friend Andy. Um, so if you just go back a slide, um, that one. I, I, was, <laughs> I was setting up this shot and my friend Andy was with me and it just needed smoke. It just needed that. And we had a fire going, but there was no smoke coming out. And so poor Andy is, is in front of the fire, just fanning like that. <laughs> Just to give that little little touch of smoke from the chimney. It does, uh, and it just just makes that shot, doesn't it? And but yeah, just, it's not really staged, so that that's absolutely fine. We we can. Yeah, we're this. having a fire anyway. So. <laughs> I mean, I love the colours in this as well. I mean, obviously those autumnal colours, the heather. It again, it just it just looks so stunningly beautiful. And I think it's it's only that quality that you can get through large format photography as well. Definitely, it's one of those formats that you know. I'm always happy when I see them on screen and, you know, but really they come into their own when you see them in print. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of those formats that is, it, it's just built for print. Um, but yeah, sort of every single blade of grass, you know, every single, and that's part of the process of it as well. Like this guy Giles on the Isle of Sky. I'm stood, I'm using a 150 millimeter lens on the 5.4. So I'm sort of decent distance away from him. And but he doesn't realise that I've got a loop, a magnifier, and I'm looking at every single eyelash. And he hasn't got a clue that I'm really sort of studying his face in that much detail. And I know it sounds kind of odd to a non-photographer, but hopefully everyone in this chat will get it. You never really get the chance to really stare at someone unless you're doing photography. You know, if you just got someone in the street and look at their eyelashes, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little bit, you know, peculiar. But with this 5.4 camera, you really get, you learn something about that person. You're, you're staring at every contour, every detail. Um, it's quite an intense moment, actually. Yeah, um, and it certainly comes across in the prints I've seen, that detail, the quality. And, and also, I wanted to ask you, actually, that obviously you, you produce the monograph Black Dots as well. And I, I just wondered if, if you'd always envisaged the work being shown through a photo book, through a publication of some sort, or do you see the, the, the print on the wall as important as the publication, or is one better or worse than the other? Are they just different? I think they're different ways of interacting you know, with the work. Some people don't enjoy going to exhibitions. Some people prefer, oh, sorry, I haven't been to change that light. We've got a power, a power issue. In. <laughs> uh, it's what comes with living on Dartmoor, unfortunately. <laughs> if that's the only problem, then you're, you're still in the right place, trust me. It gave us a chance to see the picture behind you as well. Oh, spot on, perfect. <laughs> um, but no, I, on, when I was making the work, I wasn't really thinking about, about a book. To be honest with you, I wasn't really thinking about why I was doing it. I just wanted to do it. I've never, at that point, I'd never really been, I hadn't collected photo books. I hadn't, I'd seen them at uni, but I'd never really been a big photo book person, you know. Um, but as the work developed, and I started to look at, I had test prints pinned up all over the wall. And I was thinking, yeah, this, this could make something interesting. And yeah, then I struck up the relationship with Ian from Another Place Press. And he worked wonders with, you know, sequencing of the photographs and um yeah and it, it presented the work in a new way for me as well like i hadn't seen it like that or thought about it like that you know i wanted to ask you actually um and we haven't got any we haven't got some spreads from the book here but i just wondered um what how you approach the sequencing because you know, a lot of what you're doing are quite in a way singular um they've got this overarching theme obviously but the individual prints work I mean I think they work really well as single prints on a wall in an exhibition or you know in a something like the IPE but they 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 also I think work really well is that in that sequence within the publication how, how did you go about doing that because it seems a, a really difficult thing to do yeah I think that's it was the hardest thing is to let go of control to some extent and um 
you know, obviously I still, I still had the final say, but someone who makes photo books for a living knows a lot more about photo books than, than someone that takes pictures, you know? So for me, it was really, it was a collaboration between Ian and myself. Um, and it was, cause I, the problem with it is I'd been shooting the work for so long and the prints had been on my wall, whatever order they were on my wall, that was the sequence I'd become used to, you know? So to see it any differently was wrong. Um, so actually to give it to a fresh pair of eyes and to say, how would you order this? And then to come, and there were some similarities, like the opening image is the one that's behind me here. And that's what I'd always see. That's the, that's the first image. Um, but yeah, it was very much a collaboration with, with Ian for that. And would you, would you do anything differently now? Are you, are you comfortable with how that public, that monograph publication is? Or <laughs> I had a conversation with Ian about this the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to do a second edition. Um, whether that second edition exists as an identical version of, of edition one or whether there's more photographs made for it, um, I am, I'm yet to decide. But um, if, if it didn't get printed again, I'd be 100% happy with what Ian and myself created with, with this book. Um, but given the chance, I'd quite like to play around with it. <laughs> okay, well, I think maybe we'll leave that there then. So. Um... That, that was the Bothy project and that brings us on very neatly to Carpathia for which you received the, the RPS photographic angle bursary money for. Um, you'd obviously been to remote areas in Scotland, Dartmoor and elsewhere and I just wanted to really start off by asking you what, what was it about Carpathia which is I think part of Romania isn't it and what was it about the Carpathian mountains that really attracted you and formed the basis of that bursary application? It I think it all started with thinking about, it was rewilding, that, that's where it, it kind of started, was reading a lot about rewilding, um, you know, it's a very new word, mm. it only really existed in a dictionary for well, less than 10 years, I think, but there are so many initiatives worldwide um, looking at restoring wild spaces, um, and I began thinking a lot about it and looking at the various projects that were taking place in Romania, I'd never considered going to Romania before in my life, but there was something about the project that the organization Foundation Conservation Carpathia, which from now on I'll say FCC, because it's a lot, it's a lot quicker. <laughs> yeah. um, they're, in a nutshell, they are creating a national park that is meant to be Europe's answer to Yellowstone. And that just jumped out at me. As someone that lives in a national park, the idea of, creating one just seemed so abstract and just like so complicated that I had to sort of probe it, as, you know, um, and it all, I went out for a, with the bursary money. Um, I obviously filled up my fridge with film. Thank you very much. Um, which is crucial, <laughs> crucial to the project. Um, but I also conducted a recce and I went out there with a film crew at the time. Um, and to try and just get a sense, get a feel for the area and, and figure out whether, you know, away from Google, whether there's actually a project here, you know. Um, and as soon as we started driving around the Carpathian Mountains, I was just like, I've got to photograph this. Like in some way I have to photograph this place because it is, it is, it's ridiculously stunning, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, I'm just going to pick you up on a point there. You said that you um, you started doing some filming. Are you, are you, do you do moving image as well as still photography or, or you, is, is that just a, a means to, to record something? Well, no, I don't do any of that stuff. I'm dead for that. Um, I, initially, I was going to collaborate with a, with a film production company on this project and they were going to make a short film alongside the photo project. But for one reason or another, um, it, it didn't it didn't happen. Um, so the initial trip was with a film crew. Um, and then I just kept returning on my own and, and it just turned into a pure photography project after that. And I mean, we, we're, we're looking at some of the image now, images now from the, the project and I mean, they're quite clearly absolutely stunning landscapes, but you're also sort of going down into detail. I mean, one of the earlier images we looked at was um, examining bear tracks um, and yeah, we're, we're focusing it down on some more detail. How do you reconcile that those different that different sense of scale when you're you're looking at a vast landscape, but then going down to some of these you know, much more detailed um, 
bits of that that park and that landscape and the, and the landscape yeah so i think a big part of it was you know understanding actually how do you build a national park like how is that done um and so i i buddied up with a team of rangers that work for the ngo and i spent i spent a lot of the time on this project is spent in the back of a four by four just watching them bumping around on forest you know tarmac roads <laughs> they don't really go in for it over there um <laughs> so bumping around in the back of a, for, of a and a forest track and a land rover sort of just watching and understanding what they're doing um and initially i was sort of photographing quite close up so that photo of them analyzing bear tracks or here this photo here uh, this is um them placing a bear cage outside um like a, a farmhouse and initially when i first started i would have been photographing quite tight so you can see everything that's going on like quite a photojournalistic approach but as the project developed i was stepping further and further back to sort of frame it within the sort of wider context of the carpathian landscape but also to sort of play into the ambiguity of you never really know what they're doing because a huge part of it for me is a national park is built upon hundreds of thousands of tiny seemingly insignificant tasks being done day after day after day after day and it's quite repetitive um, and so really you know you see the papusha mountain in the back and you've got this small holding and this is just three guys placing one cage in an area that's probably seventy thousand hectares mm. you know or picking up a single bear hair and putting it in a test tube in a huge forest like that individual act is seemingly insignificant, but it is a huge part of the bigger picture of how you create this wilderness reserve. Yeah, I think what's interesting for me as well, looking at these pictures again, is that you know in the UK, our national parks generally, perhaps with the exception of parts of Scotland, our national parks are quite managed spaces. They're relatively, I mean, of course, there are parts that are very wild, but generally they're quite managed in, um, and yet here we're looking at landscapes that to me seem to be mostly the opposite. They're, they're largely un, unmanaged, they're much more wilderness spaces with then little pockets of, of people. Were you interacting much with the people at all that were living in the, the park? I, um, yeah, so the project as it exists now is, is by no means finished. It's, it's very much a, a work in progress, as is the actual process of building the national park. Um, the way I see it is splitting it into separate chapters because one of the key things is wildlife monitoring, which is actually quite a revolutionary thing that they're doing over there in Romania. Um, traditionally, the monitoring of wildlife was, was done by hunting associations, um, which is kind of prone to falsification so they could obtain higher hunting quotas. Um, but what the FCC are doing is they're going in there and they're collecting samples of scat of urine of hair they're measuring footprints and every single little detail gets logged into an app um, and it's all viewable on this live map um, so you can track every single animal and where it's been what it's doing um, so that's a huge part of it is the wildlife monitoring aspect you know romania's got the highest population of you know large carnivores european brown bear lynx wolf um, in the whole of europe and so that's a major part of it the second part is the forest restoration program and the replanting of the forests that were illegally felled and then thirdly is the community uh, and so interacting with the people that would ultimately fall within this new national park so that image before and this one here in a village called Chalkano, which is will fall within this new national park um, and so that's something that's really very much my focus for the next 12 months or so when i'm allowed to travel again um is yeah is, is dealing with that community conflict resolution um hearts and minds aspect you know of convincing maybe the older generations that this is a really good thing um and you shouldn't just shoot that bear if it comes too close to your farm <laughs> you know and is is that still a problem at the moment is there this intergenerational difference that people see the bear as a threat to livestock and, and perhaps a younger so, generation that's perhaps got a greener outlook is seeing it something that Will actually encourage and enhance the the landscape and the the fauna generally exactly yeah it's definitely there's definitely a generation thing there and also in these more rural communities um you know there there's not a lot of money there 
And if a bear comes into your village and kills the only pig that you have that's going to get you through winter, you're going to want to shoot that bear. Um, and so really it's about going in there and explaining to them the, the benefits of not doing that um, and trying to really explain that bigger picture of how Romania can become this sort of green capital of Europe and, you know, a force to be reckoned with with regards to ecotourism and things like that. But it's, it's, a, it's a very, very steep learning curve. Um, and it is for me as well. Like I'm there sometimes and I'm just like, this is really ambitious. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. You, I mean, you said that, um, and I know that your this project is still an ongoing project, and we're a few years on from the bursary. And how do you have a an endpoint in time, or are you waiting till you feel that you've got this body of work that picks up on those different themes that it allows you then to do something with it? Yeah, I, th I think it's it's impossible for me to put a you know an endpoint on it. Um, I think. I'll just carry on photographing until I feel that there's enough of the conversation there, you know. Um, but the, it's it's so reliant on the season. So like here, the forest replanting, um, that really happens in a very small window. And, you know, life being what it is, sometimes I can't just jump on a plane and go to Romania. So that's like, oh, I'll do that next spring. And then something else comes up and then, you know. So when I met with the NGO at the very beginning of this, I said, just so you're aware, you're going to see a lot of me. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's not, I, I live by this line, it says, it's not good when it's done, it's done when it's good. So I'm just going to carry on going out there until I feel like it's becoming a bit repetitive or I, I've said enough, you know. And do you have a sense at the moment um, what, you, what you might do with this work? Is it going to be another monograph, a publication, an exhibition? both or you or you how are you looking at then using this work to you know to actually tell a bigger story for people like me and the audience here about what's happening in Romania yeah I, I, I mean definitely definitely aiming for a book with it um I'll, and I'll, again I'll, I've already had the first solo show of this was out in in Bucharest um last year um they run an international photo festival over there that's quite new um and I, I worked as the international coordinator for that festival um, off the back of this work um, but there's definitely yeah I'm definitely targeting uh, this to be get to go for a book exhibitions of course um, but again similar to Black Dots right now I'm very much sort of tunnel vision I'm just sort of focusing on shooting um, there's no I'm not going to rush it and there's there's no there's no need to rush it um, so I'm just it's going to slowly tick over and what was what was the response to the, the first showing of some of this work <laughs> um, I tell you what the, uh, the the biggest response I get is when they look under the dark cloth for the first time. <laughs> uh, this, this, this guy Mushu, um, he looked under and he said something to the translator that was with me, and the translator was just like, "He's asking why his sheep are upside down." <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they just they they love it. Like they're uh, they're so accommodating, and it must be such um, I must be such a pain for them. Every, I'm stopping them and going, oh, like this will be really good later on. And they're coming out at all sorts of hours so that I can get the photos that I need to get. Um, and when they see, they went into the photo festival and they saw this like 50 inch prints of them. Um, yeah, they were, they were over the moon with it. I think they took them home with them actually afterwards. So I think they got them. Sounds perfect. It's where they, where they should be, I think. And in fact, they'll they're be your best ambassadors when you go back now. So they've got a, a 50 inch portrait of themselves of the five. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this shot here, this is um, the last winter I was out there. Um, that was tracking wolf um, along the Dambovita Valley. Mm. Uh, the wolf tracking generally takes place in the winter um, because I didn't know this. It might be common knowledge, but I tell everyone as if it's like I've discovered it, but it's probably, <laughs> it's probably common knowledge. Um, I didn't realise that wolf follow the footprints of the, the lead wolf. And so it's really hard to determine pack size. Um, and the best place to do it is at river crossings like this, where they have to jump. Mm -hmm. And so when they jump, they all scatter and then they can count the wolf pack. So we were on the tail of this pack of wolf for a couple of days. Um, and you can smell it. They mark their scent in the woods. It's a very, it's a very uh, memorable scent. Mm -hmm. uh, How big was that wolf pack then? I can't, I can't remember. Honestly, <laughs> 
but it's it's a it's terrifying when you you see the, the single tracks and then they get to the forest and they split um, with like military precision. Um, it's quite terrifying to be in a forest when you know that that's around you. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's not you not the best environment to be in with a blanket over your head. Put it that way. <laughs> and are you generally working alone? Are you out there? I mean, in terms of the photography, do you have an assistant? Do you have someone that's working with you that can help with dark slides and reloading film, or, or are you? Yeah. So uh, there's no assistant with it. It's just me. I go out on my own, um, and then I I buddy up with. Uh, I get myself to to the village on the edge of the project area, um, and then the rangers kind of come out with me. Um, but I usually I load up about. I've got a, the loading tent in the hotel room, and I'll load up about 15 dark slides, um, and I'll just take them out all the time because um, you never know what you're going to find or how long it's going to be till you get to, get a chance to change film again. You know. Yeah. Um, actually, and we've got some trap pictures here as well. Is this something again that you're involved in um, setting up and working on? Or? No, so these, these again, these are sort of experiments at the moment. Um, I wanted to include the wildlife, but as a, as a, a large format photographer, it's, uh, it doesn't lend itself well to photographing bear. <laughs> um, and so one of the ways in which they're monitoring the wildlife is by laying camera traps and collecting this archive. Um, and so I've actually been creating diptychs using the archive um, of, of the sort of nighttime camera trap footage that they've kept, that the rangers themselves have captured. So it's quite nice to be able to use their own footage that's used for very much sort of research purposes and bring it into my my project, you know. Um, but yeah, and these, this is a wolf pack passing through at night. The, the, I like the, the image on the left, you see the lead wolf and then you can just see a faint pair of eyes in the back left. Um, but yes, yeah, so I've, I've sifted through hundreds and hundreds of these little six by four prints um, to find diptychs that I really liked. Again, yeah, I think this this image coming up now is just yeah, it just sums up for me that you know that landscape and it's an incredibly beautiful image. I think um, I think it's only, it's only the sort of image you can really get through well your obviously experience of course, but also through land, uh, large format photography. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's um, this is up. Commercial bear hide. Um, they, they've constructed three or four bear hides. Um, sort of, they, they bring tourists up, and you can already book in, and you can go on bear watching trips with them, and things like that, uh, and see bears in their natural environment. And this was a trip up to um, just check on one of the bear hides, and this is the view standing out on the front of the bear hide, looking out. Uh, you can actually see that in the background. That ridge line is the Piazza di Cria Louis um, National Park, which is Prince's Rock National Park, and it's that's an already existing national park in the area uh, in the foreground. That's the area that the FCC are working in. And you can see the area that's been illegally felled where the snow's fallen. So eventually that area you see and the national park in the background there um, will, will join up and then it will become this massive sort of wilderness reserve. So I've got to ask you because um, you know, most of us have been locked down for the past, whatever, 13, 14 weeks. Mm -hmm. Clearly, someone that's out loves to be outside in in the wilderness, in, and and I, I know you're living in Dart on on Dartmoor. But how how have you coped with lockdown? I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it's you know I as you say I live on Dartmoor, and you know there's there's no end of of walks that you can go on here. And I've actually I'll be honest with you, like I've been really enjoying going on walks without the camera because um, as I said earlier you know I do a lot of um, commissions and, you know, and stuff like that so it's, it's usually quite hectic and you never really get a chance to just enjoy home um, and so initially obviously the first few weeks I was very much like oh I've just lost all my work and I can't even go and do personal projects <laughs> um, but yeah as that subsided and you sort of settled into the new way of things um, going out and exploring Dartmoor again um, yeah, has been a godsend, really. And has that has that sort of rekindled, maybe not memories, but certainly a love of Dartmoor from those first two pictures we saw at the very beginning of the the, the chat this evening, and, and when you were first there as a child. Definitely, it's it's kind of like it's like an old friend. Where, you know, it's always it's always been there. Whenever you know, I went through uni, I needed to do a project. I went to Dartmoor as a child. Our holidays were Dartmoor, and now again. You know the area that I go and 
even when I'm researching ideas for Romania or other projects, I do it while walking on Dartmoor. So it's, it's this kind of, I rarely photograph it, but it, it offers me so much more than that. Mm. Well, I know, um, and you told me when we were talking beforehand um, on Monday that uh, you, you've got some ideas for future projects and you've been putting a, a couple of sneak pictures up on Instagram. <laughs> Do yeah. I, are you able to share? Do you want to share uh, with the audience uh, what, what you're thinking or what, what you, you, some of the ideas that you're thinking about at the moment? I mean, there's, I mean it's not that exciting. <laughs> I'm sure it's more exciting than that. I mean, obviously, the, the big one is, is figuring out the future of, of this work in Romania. Um, and I, I foresee you know, spending a few months of next year out there. Um, but there's this, I posted recently online this, this um, this image from a work in progress called the dust and the vein which is this um really it's not about anything i was thinking about this after we spoke and you were like oh so what's the new work about and i was like that's a really good point i don't really know i've just been returning to a to a slate mine every winter for about three to four years but only going there in a hailstorm mm. so and it's it's in the lake district so it's you know it's sort of it's six seven hours from here and I'll watch the weather and I'll, I'll go up and I'll take, I'll take two sheets of black and white film and then I'll come back. And it's almost, it's, it's quite nice to be making work that is really just a study of form, of shape, of, of, a, of a landscape that changes over time. Um, these, these spoil heaps at the Honister slate mine, because it's a working slate mine, every week it changes shape. Um, and so, you can photograph this sort of quite conical looking volcanic mound covered in hail. Um, and then you go back the next year and where you were standing is actually 20 foot in the air and it's taken on this different shape. It's almost like trying to break into the matrix code. You know, every time <laughs> it, kind of, it just sort of rearranges itself. And so I'm just enjoying every year I'm just going back there and sitting up at the slate mine for two or three days in the cold. <laughs> It sounds quite it sounds quite sad but i'm sure it will come to something yeah it sounds like it will actually and, it, and in a way it's sort of bringing photography back to the you know the very basics of doc, you know the essentially documentary but actually shape and form and texture yeah. you know some of those sort of very basic parts of photography and i well I look, all i can say is i look forward to seeing how that progresses um if anyone wow. wants to see more then do have a look at nicholas's instagram feed and you can find that really easily on instagram so um, go out and check that out because it's, it's really interesting and it's interesting to see what Nicholas is working on at the moment. So just to conclude our conversation before we open up the, uh, the Q&A, um, I'd like to just ask you a couple of quite specific questions about the bursary um, and the first one's really about process for anyone in this evening who might be thinking of applying for the postgrad or the environmental bursary. Um, have you got any tips for someone that's putting in an application either for one of the RPS bursaries or perhaps for funding more generally? You know, it's a tough, tough time at the moment and there's often a lot of competition. What, what would you say to anyone thinking about applying? Well, I mean, obviously do it. <laughs> it's, my, it's my first bit of advice. But I think it's, I think it's important to not just invent some project idea that you think kind of fits because you really want a bursary mm. um if that makes sense so something i do is i i've got a little notepad and there are when i have an idea of something that could work i jot it down i do some research some of them just get forgotten and some of them grow and i become really obsessive over it um and so there's always this sort of ongoing list of things that i m would never achieve <laughs> you know um and then i and i look out for bursaries and when the environmental bursary came up i was I'd already been looking into rewilding and figuring out how I was going to work this idea in Romania um, and it just fitted and because I'd done all that research beforehand and sort of figured out why I was interested in this thing how I would respond to it 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 re re sort of reduced the pressure on the application a little bit because I wasn't sitting there going mm, like yeah you know I, I already knew the idea um, and so I didn't need to leave it till the last minute I didn't need to stress over it um, I already had the idea and it existed. So that would be my first, my biggest tip is if you have an idea at any point in the year, even if there's no bursary open, just jot it down and just be curious and research it and learn it. Because the, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to learn something new. And that's not a bad thing. 
Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And um, from the other side, you know, having looked and reviewed quite a lot of bursary applications over the last, what, five or 10 years probably now, um, you, you can sort of see those where the applicant has put in the, the thinking, they've, they've been incredibly um, thoughtful about how they've approached that and you know that they haven't just you know, put it down on paper in the last hour before the deadline and I think that does make a big difference because I think you tend to approach you know, the project probably in with more in more seriousness but also I think with more passion as well that you've you spent time doing that research and developing it over a period of time. Yeah no absolutely and it's also not you know there, there's a a lot of photographers out there who who are sitting on projects they've really researched and they're crying out for funding so I don't think it's fair to just try and snatch and grab any money that's going you know if it doesn't apply to you and you, you know don't don't just pull something out of a hat you know um, but yeah. yeah I think mean, that's really good advice for any any funding application whether it's through the RPS or through any of the educational bodies or other photography organizations as well is you know, passion and actually proper research and development of the project is, is key. The other question I'm going to ask you specifically about bursaries and, and this, in this case specifically about the, the RPS bursary you got was um, really what, what did receiving that funding um, enable to, you to do that you wouldn't have been able to have done otherwise? Um, well, start it. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those. It's one of those projects that, again, because I of the camera I use, and and because it was over, in, it was abroad. There's a lot of costs involved with just going out there and trying to figure out whether it's even going to work, and to have the bursary and the backing, it gave me that confidence to go right. I can go out there now, and I can, I can take that hit, and I can figure it out because I've got this money to help fund the development of the work. Sometimes you're sitting on a really fantastic idea, but the financial worry is the thing that prevents you from doing it. Um, you could have the ability to do it, you could have the best idea, but if you can't afford to get there, yeah, that could be so frustrating and demoralizing. So yeah, to have that money available and to, and to buy the film and to cover my development costs at the lab and to fund that initial recce for me to go out and make the preliminary sort of images, where, then I could come back and go, yeah, this is this is something I'm going to commit to 100 yeah. percent brilliant that's fantastic advice so thank you for that um, we've been we've been gossiping and nattering for, for far too long we need, um, we need to open out to our audience so I'm going to bring the audience back in now and open up the Q and a so just bear with yeah. me one moment this is the pressure bit right <laughs> <laughs> so welcome back to our audience thank you for for listening to nicholas and myself talking and, and looking at nicholas's wonderful photography um if any of you have got questions please use the chat function and we're, we'll pick off the questions there um and we've got some already uh so the first question i can see here from nigel is what sports photography do you do something completely different <laughs> yeah fair enough uh, hang on, I'm going to turn the lights on again because uh, there's no point having a Zoom chat in the dark, is there? Um, <laughs> um, what sports photography do I do? So I do a lot of work with uh, retailers and with brands. So one of my main, the main people I shoot for is Puma. Um, I do a lot of the Puma football content for the UK. Um, that all started off the back of my first ever job. When I was working on Black Dots, I had a full-time job, initially as an e-commerce photographer, photographing football boots. Um, and then I progressed onto the creative team of six photographers, um, you know, shooting campaigns for this retailer and then taking time off and pretending I had sick days <laughs> to, go, to go and shoot Black Dots. Um, and then I took that knowledge and applied it to my freelance career. Um, and now, so I, I don't really sit pitch side, or anything like that I usually work with footballers and with product okay well wow, that's really interesting I haven't realized that side to you so thank you no um, we've got questions coming in thick and fast now um, so Tom Andrews said he loved the talks thank you Tom um, he says he's totally digital and he's curious to know what if any post-production work do you do and what tools do you use okay um, so I'm guessing you mean for my you mean for my personal work. Uh, doesn't say, but let's start with the personal work. Yeah. So 
I don't do much post-processing at all. So the camera I'm using for my personal work is a Chamonix 4.5. Um, so it's like a modern version of, a, of the traditional 5x4 field camera. Um, and then, yeah, I'm shooting on color neg, scan it myself at home on, on just a flatbed initially, and then send them off to be drum scanned. Um, but I actually do the inversion myself. So I scan them as a negative and then I'll convert them to positive in post myself. Uh, it just gives me a lot more control over the colors and everything rather than letting the, the scanner decide how it should look or the software decide how it should look. Um, other than that, it's, it's basically the same as you do in the dark room, you know, a bit of dodging, a bit of burning. Um, the biggest pain is dust and scratch removal. Um, but really, no, I just allow the film to be the film pretty much. Um, when it comes to my other work, I just unleash hell on capture one and just, <laughs> I'm, just I'm dropping presets left, right and center on that. Um, but yeah, but for my, for my project work, there's next to no, um, post-production other than just color correction and things like that. Um, on your project, uh, Nicholas, I'm going to ask a follow-up question on behalf of Tom. Um, are you doing your own printing? Do you have a lab that you use regularly? Who, who, who do you, or how do you do your prints? So I use a, I don't develop the film myself because I don't, I don't trust myself <laughs> enough. And also labs generally have a lot more, a lot better ways of disposing of the expired chemicals um, than just letting it go down your sink or down your bathtub. Um, so I send, it to, I send it to a lab in Plymouth called Spectrum Photo Labs. It's something like three pound a sheet or something like that for 5.4. Um, and then, yeah, then obviously scan it myself. Um, for printing, um, I'm, I'm kind of in between. I'm, quite, I, I, I'm experimenting with different, different printers, but Metro and the print space are generally the ones I'd use for, for my prints. Okay, thank you. Um, so oh, lots more questions coming in here. Um, so Caroline, Odes is asking, along with Simon Norfolk, who have been the other influences on your work? <sighs> um, <laughs> where does it start? <laughs> and we, we spoke about Simon and Ansel Adams uh, and possibly sure. Cornish. Joe Cornish, yeah, of course. Uh, Richard Mizrach, Sophie Ristel Huber. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's something that I. I, quite, I think I, I, I pride myself on it, is that I'm very open. I cast my net quite wide. Um, and so, you know, if you looked at my, my photo books, there's, there's a very obscure mix of stuff. Like I, um, and especially unknown photographers, like I like to sort of, I'll go on photo book store or something like that, and I'll just, I'll just buy a random photo book, you know. Um, but I think, yeah, Simon Norfolk, was definitely a turning point and Richard Mizrach as well, Richard Moss um, and, yeah, and Sophie Ristol huber as well. They're, they're all the people that I looked at at university that really um, sort of forced me to think differently. And are, there any, are there any photographers working today that you, you know, particularly enjoy their work, even if it's not necessarily inspiring your own, but you just enjoy the sort of work that they're producing? Um, Oh yeah, I mean, I don't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> it's like, no, there's not, no, no one's making anything into it. I mean, obviously now we're living in a time where there are so many great photographers. Um, my Instagram feed is just, you know, every day you see, you know, it's like, oh wow, this is incredible. Um, trying to think of a particular name. I can't put my, th I mean, Olaf Otto Becker is someone that I've, I've had this huge, sort of love for his work and his photo books for a very long time. And he's one of those photographers that you don't really hear a lot about and then he'll just drop the massive book, <laughs> you know. Um, so someone like him, but a lot of the photographers actually that Another Place Press are publishing at the moment. Um, so go over and check, check out that website because a lot of those books are from sort of emerging photographers as well who are, who are making really, really interesting work. But it's really hard for me, I don't, I look at photography every single day, so it's really hard for me to sort of pin out an individual, like a, a name. You know In that I mean? case, we'll we take you on to the next question then. Um, and it's from Carl Ramberg. Uh, how do you do your research? Do you keep notebooks? Do you plan specific photographs? What's the process of research that goes into your photography? Um, obviously, yeah, notebooks are a big thing. I've got a huge sort of seven foot 
no notice board in my office that is just it's just the ramblings of a man most of the time um and like, as i said earlier a lot of these ideas i'll just i'll see something or i'll read about something um and i'll be like oh and it'll just trigger something I'll, I'll go and write it down and sometimes those ideas just fall by the wayside and they never get explored um but it's the ones that I keep thinking about like when I go to bed at night or I'm out walking on the moors and I'll start kind of going over and over this um, this idea and then it'll come off the notice board and onto the desk and then I'll start doing a lot of research about it um, and and yeah sort of like I do like to sort of pre-plan photos I know for black dots that was a huge part of it like reading the landscape from maps figuring out where the light's going to be and, and trying to get a feel for how it might look but at the same time yeah, always allowing room for surprises because as Romania has shown me anything can happen <laughs> <laughs> okay um, we've got some more questions here I know we're slightly over time but we will carry on I know Nicholas is happy to carry on for another 10-15 minutes or so so we we just get through some more questions uh, Tom Tom Andrews has come back again and just saying that the reason he was asking the, the quite technical questions about the post-production was that he loves the, the natural look that you achieve and he says that he sometimes feels that he tries too hard to make colours come out, but he feels that you've got the absolutely natural look. So it's perhaps more just a comment rather than a question. No, I appreciate that. Kay, Kayu, who I know, in, who's an RPS member in Beijing, thank you for joining us uh, this evening or probably very early morning. Um, he's asking what the key factors were that you felt got you the, the bursary. Sure. I think... Um, only the RPS know what happens <laughs> behind, behind the, the elusive world of the judging panel. But um, I think with any bursary, it, it's a combination of things. It's having a, it's, it's the portfolio that you submit and making sure that it shows a, the breadth of the work that's come for the proposed project um, and also shows that you might, you're going to be able to deliver on the project that you're proposing. And secondly, it's, it's, it's simply the proposal that the idea you've got is it fresh is it unique is it new um, does it touch upon something that hasn't been explored fully or does it touch upon something that has been explored but you're doing it in a sort of revolutionary way um, so yeah it's quite simple it's a combination of those two things a big part of applications is being able to do a, a financial breakdown and being able to show that you can manage money properly as well so that sort of it might seem boring like that admin side of things but if they're offering three thousand pounds they want to know that you're not just going to you know be down the mcdonald's drive through the next morning yeah um, i think that's um really good good advice it sort of follows on from what you were saying earlier about having the um the passion and the um done all the research and background before you put your application in that actually having thought carefully about how you want to use that funding is really important because you know as the rps we we obviously want to have confidence that the, the project is going to be delivered so a a properly thought through application, properly thought through budget and outline of how that money is going to be used is you know, it instills confidence, I think, which is really important. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've got a question here from Janine Cooper Plant. Um, she says, Nicholas, you're very engaging to listen to. Would you or have you considered offering talks, workshops to students within schools? And she's a high school teacher, which is why she's asking. Okay, <laughs> well, nice to meet you. Um, thanks, because I always think that I'm dreadful at this. No, you're good, you're good. Some of you may have noticed I was nursing a pint <laughs> at the beginning of this talk. Um, but I, yeah, I, I've done a few talks uh, about my work and um, I do enjoy it. Once things get started, I, uh, I do enjoy it. So I, I would love to do, to do more of these with, not just about my work, but just about approaches to projects and approaches to other people's photography. Um, I don't do enough of it. I feel like I spend a lot of time doing, jumping between th things like my own work. It'd be quite nice to, to sort of take a step in that direction and do more workshops. So, um, yeah. I've, I've given Janine uh, my email address. So um, if Janine would like to make contact, then we, we might be able to join join people up or, or certainly the RPS is always willing to, to try and put photographers into schools and, and help students you know with their own photography or develop project ideas themselves. Mm -hmm. There's a really great question here from Patricia Hilbert. Um, she says, great project. I'm from Transylvania and traveled around Brasov several times. I actually didn't know about uh, Dan Buk 
Kiora hunting area. I'm not sure I pronounced that. <laughs> or the fact that the Fagaras Mountains Natural Park could be created. Uh, she's checked with the Romanian media and it's barely mentioned. She said that she'll be sharing your images with her Romanian photo groups and, and wants to thank you for doing the, the talk and presentation this evening. Oh, thanks, Patricia. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a huge thing is, you know, the amount of people that I've met in Romania that, or Romanian friends who go, never heard of it, you know, um, which is, you know, a, a huge part, again, of that community liaison and sort of conflict resolution stuff that I was talking about earlier and, and going out into the, into the communities and really explaining what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, there's a great organisation here in the UK called the European Nature Trust that does a lot of promotion on the behalf of these organisations. Um, but yeah, a, a huge part of it is, is pushing it out to the Romanian people and, and teaching them what's going on there, you know. Right, well that's a, probably a, a good point to start to draw the proceedings to a close. Um, Nicholas, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your thoughts, your, uh, your photographs obviously, and, and how you've approached your projects. And um, I think we all look forward to seeing how this particular project develops and what might happen with some of those other ideas that are floating around you and your, your Instagram feed. So um, thank you for your time this evening and thank you to all of our um, people watching and listening online. Um, I know a lot of you have come from outside of the UK and it's really good to see you. China, Australia, Canada, I saw come up, Europe too, and obviously our, our UK attendees. So I said I would just put those two slides back up again. Um, so if you are, aren't a member and would like to join the RPS, then um, please take advantage of the offer that we have for the non-members. You can get a discount on your membership and the, the link and the email contact is there for you. We'd love to welcome you on board as a, as a member of the RPS. And if you are already a member of the RPS, thank you again for your support and, and for allowing us to put on talks with people like Nicholas and, and other great photographers. Um, there's more coming up over the next few months and into the autumn, so thank you. And if you'd like to bring a friend on board into the RPS, then um, both you and your friend will receive a 20% discount off both memberships. So do take advantage of that. So again, finally, Nicholas, thank you so much for your time this evening. And your, and your images and I know we're, we're going to keep in touch the RPS will keep in touch with you anyway and um, thank you again everyone this evening for, for joining us and we, we look forward to seeing you next time thank you thank you